There's no shortage of deep dives into Kendrick Lamar's discography. Whether it's breaking down verses or trying to piece together the narrative of entire projects, the analysis of his albums is a staple of his fan base. As an artist, the overanalyzation of art has never been that personally appealing to me because it eviscerates some of the mystery and therefore the magic of what makes these pieces so special. There are content creators, of course, that are incredibly knowledgeable and have certainly given me a new level of appreciation for the art that they talk about but this is increasingly rare. Nowadays, it feels like almost everybody is presenting surface level explanations that the artists themselves could not have made more apparent. And this is especially a problem when it comes to the music essay niche on YouTube. You have to have an air of entitlement to even produce a video attempting to explain or break down an artist's work because in doing so, you have to believe that you can present something to the potential viewers that they don't already know. This isn't an issue when you truly do, but when genius is a click away, I have doubts to who's trying to offer unique perspectives and and who just want to pretend to have one. So I'm not going to try and explain the emotional impact of lyrics, take massive leaps into the mindset Kendrick was in when he wrote these songs, or try and explain what I think he means by choosing to use these allegories. Instead, I'm going to offer a perspective on what I believe is the objective truth, something that was apparent to me while listening to this album, that can hopefully help you understand the album a little bit better. And that's that Mr. Morale was highly influenced by the Martin Scorsese film, The Last Temptation of Christ. Kendrick is probably the most influential artist in my life. As a musician, he's influenced my style, what I write about, and how I've approached making my album. But most of all, he's influenced my philosophy on quality. You can probably tell from my slur, but I grew up in the Bible Belt. Growing up, my father was an on and off Catholic, my grandmother was half native, believed in the Great Spirit, and my mother is still a Baptist that hasn't stepped foot into a church since like 04. Religion was never really that important to anybody that raised me, and because of this, most of my conscious life, I've been agnostic. Two years ago, after after rewatching Platoon, I decided to watch the Scorsese film the Last Temptation of Christ. The film and the novel it's based on, written by Nikos Kazaniskis, depicts Jesus as a man, a sinful man, with guilt, shortcomings, and temptations. A Jesus that had hesitations about becoming the Messiah. Temptation depicts not just the physical pain that the more popular Passion of the Christ dives into, but the psychological pain of allowing your own crucifixion. This depiction of Christ was so controversial that in 1955, when the novel was published, the Greek Orthodox Church attempted to have the author's entire bibliography banned, labeling the book vulgar and blasphemous. In 88, the film was even more controversial. It got banned in eight countries, including Singapore and the Philippines, where it's still banned today, led Scorsese to receive death threats, incited protest, a terrorist attack, and was called a Holocaust movie that has the power to destroy souls eternally. The Last Temptation has become one of my favorite movies. After watching it for the first time, I fell into the rabbit hole of studying the Bible from a more academic perspective, changing how I view religion dramatically. Kendrick has always seemed to be religious, and if you're a listener of his, it's probably easy for you to accept the statement that he's a Christian. But I don't think that's entirely true, or at least not in the modern sense, and here's why. They judge you, they judge Christ. I wear this as a representation so you'll never forget one of the greatest prophets that ever walked the earth. In Christian theology, it's believed that Jesus was the Son of God or that he literally was God. You should note that Jesus never actually claimed to be God. This belief started because of a few lines in the Gospel of John that Christians latch on to. Kendrick's statement is indicative of either one of two things. One, he didn't want to offend anybody in the crowd by claiming Jesus was God or the Son of God. Or two, his beliefs on Christianity have fundamentally changed. I find the latter to be the most likely explanation as to why he said what he said on that stage. His performance got immediate backlash from the terminally online Christian community for being blasphemous, but these are the same people that would be protesting outside of a theater in 88. Mr. Morale is a very scriptural project. There's over 60 unique references to God, religion, and faith on the album. On average, that's over three references every track. Comparing it to a quote-unquote Christian album like Donda, Kendrick actually speaks on these topics slightly more. And the entire narrative hinges on this Christ allegory Kendrick has painted for himself, even down to the music videos. But if you notice, while he compares himself to Jesus multiple times throughout the album, he also pays respects to many religious figures. The now this isn't necessarily rare for religious people to do, but given the context, I believe it to be telling for just how he views religion. Think of everybody you know with a biblical name. Matthew, Luke, John, James, Jeremiah, there's hundreds. But when naming his second child, Kendrick and his significant other decided to name him Enoch, the most famous scrapped book of the Bible, named after the legend Enoch son of Jared, or Kendrick possibly named his son after Enoch son of Cain. The Bible actually appears to intentionally 
contrast these two genealogies, with Cain's lineage becoming pioneers in cities, the arts, science, but doing so while falling deeper into sinfulness. The descendants of Seth, on the other hand, focused mostly on worship, eventually leading to Noah. I think it's well established that Kendrick has a different view on Christianity than most Christians do, but at this point, nothing I've said has really connected to The Last Temptation outside of being about Jesus. He could have easily come up to this conclusion on his own. The reason I believe The Last Temptation influenced this belief of his, or at the very least this album, is because of four tracks on the second half, commonly referred to as the Mr. Morale disc. And those would be Savior, Auntie Diaries, Mother I Sober, but most importantly, Mirror. But before we get into that, here's a word from today's sponsor. There was this controversial figure. Everywhere he went, people challenged him. They questioned his ideology, trolled him, called him ugly names. But he never took the bait, never raised his voice, refused to retaliate because he believed he could change the world by turning the other cheek. Savior is obviously about Kendrick rejecting the idea that he is one, a feeling he echoed earlier in Crown, and also something that is unique to Jesus' depiction in The Last Temptation, questioning whether or not he is the Messiah many times. Kendrick also contradicts biblical teachings. I find it just but most importantly, he questions whether he should follow a religious conspiracy theory or believe in the vaccine. And although the Kyrie Irving theory was a bit ridiculous, it's a great example of weighing science over religion. And then on Auntie Diaries, much of the fourth verse is Kendrick telling a story of standing up and arguing against a representative of the church, somebody that was belittling his trans relative. He sing with you out to prove his point, saying Demetrius is Marianne now. Church is auntie is a man now. Using biblical references to point out the failings of the preacher. It's forcing me to stand now. I said, Mr. Preacher, man, should we love thy neighbor? The laws of the land of the heart was greater. Kendrick chooses to stick by his family instead of sticking by his faith. The dad chose humanity over religion. The family got closer, it was all forgiven. This line specifically made a lot of people upset, but you could argue that this is something Jesus himself did many times, which is why Christians now hold the teachings of the New Testament to a much higher regard than the teachings of the old. You ever hear him say, you know, like, oh, the Old Testament, yeah, God did all that mean shit, but we don't really pay attention to that. Mother I Sober is an interesting song, even just focusing purely on the religious themes and not on the context. It starts off with Kendrick continuing to feel conflicted on his savior complex, but then he goes on to talk about how he's finding more spiritual satisfaction in nature than he does in religion. Told you I was Christian, but just not today. I transformed, praying to the trees, God is taking shape. And the song ends with what I would consider the climax of the album. I set free the hearts filled with hatred. Keep our bodies sacred as I set free all your abusers. This is transformation. Although Kendrick has denied his savior status many times at this point, he still ends the narrative off with setting free guilt, hurt, hatred, and forgiving those that cause these things. In The Last Temptation, the psychology of Jesus is very different than that depicted in the Bible. But the only real plot point that differs from the traditional story comes during his time on the cross. In the film, as Jesus is being crucified, an angel comes to Jesus and offers him a way out, telling him that God, much like he did with Abraham, was only testing Jesus to see if he was willing to die for the salvation of humanity. Because of this, Jesus asks the angel if he's the Messiah. The angel tells Jesus that no, while he's not the Messiah, he's done enough and can now live his life as a man. Jesus is relieved because while he doesn't have to be sacrificed, he still saved humanity. He gets married, his wife dies, my man starts fucking two sisters, which Kendrick might actually be referring to on Mr. Morale, as children and enjoys life in this dusty ass country. But when Jerusalem gets attacked, it's revealed that the angel was actually Satan, who had tricked him into believing that that he didn't have to be crucified to save the world. After this realization, Jesus crawls back to the place of his crucifixion and begs God to let him be the Messiah and to die on the cross. Overcoming his last and final temptations of escaping death and having a family, Jesus is either awoken from the hallucinations or sent into the multiverse, it's not very clear, and finally allows his own crucifixion. Kendrick actually reflects this in Mirror. Instead of overcoming the temptations, he accepts them. Not only does he tell the listeners that we shouldn't wait on him, but he also says that he'd rather be the imperfect man, the selfish man that others are disappointed by, than their savior. You won't grow away, no me. I can't live in the matrix. Rather fall short of your graces. He also addresses that he's not willing to give up the things he enjoys in his life for the outside world. 
I don't know how else you could really explain this line without it being a direct reference to Jesus returning on the cross from his life of temptation. The hook is literally just Kendrick deciding to choose himself, I choose me. and he points out that this isn't really his fault. Nobody should be held to a Christ standard such as certain artists are today. Baby, I told you story and lay down all the rules, cause critical thinking is a deal breaker, faith in one man is a ship sinking. Kendrick represents this no way better than the $3 million crown of thorns he wore during the album release. Once again, this was a major issue for Christians as they saw it as blasphemous and disrespectful, but Kendrick wasn't using this in a way to promote the idea that he was Christ-like. In fact, he was doing the opposite. He says multiple times he does his best to walk in Christ's image, but he's not Christ. He gives in to greed, temptations, he's a very rich and successful man, a hypocritical man, and that's okay. The fans, the culture, and the world are not his responsibility. And although he could try and promote the most positive message at all times, he can't please everybody. The album has been labeled thematically inconsistent and gimmicky by some, but once viewed through this lens, I think the album and Kendrick's intentions are incredibly clear. And although Kendrick isn't willing to be crucified, with the addition of the heart part 5 into the album, it fully completes the narrative. Kendrick starts off with a phrase from the book of John that Christians love to mention. Then in the first two verses, he describes the ongoing issues in his community and the culture as a whole. But the third verse specifically specifically is a masterfully woven monologue told from the perspective of Nipsey Hussle, who in context has taken the place of Christ on the cross. And besides some Nipsey specific information, this verse almost reads as one last calling out from Christ himself. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention that Nipsey died at 33, which is the youngest age estimate to how old Christ was when he was crucified, pointed out by J. Cole on his song Interlude. Christ went to heaven age 33 and so did Pepsi and so did Nipsey. I believe this is the most fulfilling way of viewing this album because I believe this is what Kendrick intended. I'm not sure just how long Kendrick's been working on this concept, but I believe it's been much longer than the two years he stated. When going over the writing and preparation for this video, I came across something that I had forgotten about. If you recall, back in 2017, there were theories online about a second album dropping the same week as Damn. For some reason, people just randomly called it Nation. There was no actual reasoning for that it, besides Damn Nation, which is a stupid fucking title. But the idea was because Kendrick Kendrick notably dies at the beginning or, or the end of Damn, which was dropped on a Good Friday, he'd return on Easter resurrected with a new album. Obviously that didn't happen, but he did return as Jesus, and he did return with this infamous tweet on Easter Monday. Maybe these are coincidental, but I highly doubt it. And a couple weeks before Damn dropped, Kendrick dropped The Heart Part 4, which he had recorded just a couple days before dropping it. The Heart Part 4 is a great song, but it led to a lot of online theories as to the meaning of one particular line. My next album, the whole industry on the ice pack with TLC. You see the flames in my EYEs. Out of every possible combination, and the fact it's been so long and nobody online seems to have given a better alternative, I think it's safe to say that TLC probably meant temptation of Christ. I don't know, maybe I'm giving Kendrick a little bit too much credit, but it's something that stuck out to me from the beginning, and it feels like every other piece is falling into place. And actually, this was predicted from a few Reddit posts and tweets I came across, but Mr. Morale's been out for almost a year now, and I haven't seen anybody talk about this theory since. I wouldn't have made a video on it if I did. I mean, this is only my second video, but I'm not really interested in making videos about things that have been talked about a thousand times before. So if you want to see how a pop star probably got Donald Trump to run for office, you can do so right here. I hope this video gave you a little more insight into the album, and if you found it interesting, please let me know down below.